Okay, the hand has gone up in the room next door, so I think we're live. It's very difficult to tell um, from this end, um, but uh, welcome to the panel members uh, and uh, thank you to everybody um, who took part in the breakout sessions and who've been with us. Um, and I hope you're all um, joining uh, us after that technical glitch, which threw the whole system out. So my name is Matt Oliver. I'm the head of Think Communities. Uh, for Cambridgeshire. I'm going to lead the discussion panel today, which is a wider kind of um, discussion around localism, generally community empowerment to lead us on from the discussions that we've had um, in the breakout rooms. Um, so I'm uh, ably joined by, and I'll go in alphabetical order because um, there's no priority here, uh, with Amanda Askham, who's the interim uh, CEO for uh, Cambridgeshire County Council. Uh, Penny Bryant, who's the CEO of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Association of Local Councils. Julie Farrow, the CEO of Hunts Forum and Support Cambridgeshire. Uh, and Daryl Preston, uh, who's obviously you've seen before, who's the uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, we may be joined by Dr Nick Johnson, who's due to be here, but I think that he's still trying to log back in. We have half an hour-ish if we stick to the timescales um, that we were going to um, for this discussion and we've got a, a range of questions. Um, uh, it's a big, big topic to talk about localism um, and community empowerment in half an hour. Um, so um, people have to be mindful, but I do want to get around everybody. Um, and uh, we also, you know, want to make this as a lively debate um, and, but hopefully it won't be too spicy. So we'll see where we go and see what opinions people have. Um, and the first question that we've got for the panel, and I'm going to go around everybody in turn with this, is, um, you know, in respect of your organisations, how do you see the role of town and parish councils, um, you know, maybe helping to root uh, decision making more locally for your organisations? <laughs> We heard about, um, in, and in the chat, there were specific mentions of specific issues, you know, around drugs and crime, maybe. And um, so I just want to come first, uh, Daryl, to you to, around that question, um, around the, the link between um, your organisation and, and town and parish councils and, and maybe um, how you see um, things being rooted locally more for you. Thanks, Matt. Firstly, can I check that you can hear me? Yes, we can. And we also have uh, Dr. Nick with us, which is fantastic. I, I've turned the video off because I'm having all kinds of problems. Uh, but that's probably a good thing uh, that, that you, don't, you don't have to witness me in person. So uh, when it, for me, this is about the local. Um, and, and, you know, with, with, with all these things, it, it's, it's, it's the local that is, is key to actually breaking the, heart, the whole cycle. So what, what is it that I'm doing in my organisation? Well, well, firstly, just a bit of clarity there. Obviously, the, the constabulary is run by the chief constable, but we do have my office and I do hold them to account as well. The, the one thing I've noticed, and I've seen a bit of this in the chat room as well, um, a lot of the time our local communities don't feel they have necessarily that contact, that local contact with policing. I, I hear that time and time again, and I, I've done a series of round table events, particularly with, with councillors. And I think there is a reality to this. The reality is that over the years, yes, you know, savings have to be found. Uh, policing will also tell us that, that policing has changed to some extent, in that we now uh, have more concentration on those high harm, high risk crimes that we, we talked about earlier. Domestic abuse being a prime example. Uh, and, you know, Briefly, I, I joined the police some 35 years ago. The average domestic abuse incident would have taken quite a short amount of time to deal with because it was dealt with very differently. You know, now the average is 13, 14 hours of an officer time. So, so things have changed, and I think some of those things for the better. But, but, you know, th this contact with, with, with local residents, local communities is an imperative for me. And I go back to the police and crime panel, pushing communities first, Lots of conversations with the Chief Constable about how we push this agenda. So firstly, the, the neighbourhood policing teams are increasing in number. That's a fact they already have and we will see more. But there's also something for me uh, around this contact. Um, it seems to me that, it, that 
you might have the telephone number or contact of your local police officer, but it tends to be by luck. There's no process there. So I'm very keen that those local teams are engaging locally. One thing that we've introduced, or I've introduced to ensure is that quite often you know, people feel that you know, to, to call the police, it's 999-101, but what if it, it's just a community concern? That's, that's the bit for me that we need to address, particularly in, in your roles. Uh, so there is now, uh, uh, it took a while, but there is actually on, on the website, when you go into the Constabulary website now, you can make contact with your neighbourhood policing team directly. Uh, I, 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 if you all have a look at that, we can get the details out. Um, so coming back to the wider question you know, criminality and, and drug use, and, and this came up, and I'll be very brief here. For me, I think Nick mentioned this, and I totally agree. That there are two strands to this. There is the prevention and the enforcement. Ultimately, this is my view, but it's backed up by the recent drug strategy report that came from government. You know, that dependency bit is, is, is the key to unlocking. You know, the, the less people using drugs, addicted to drugs, you know, the less crime we will have. We would all be safer. Uh, particularly when you look at the county lines model, which is now the, 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 the route to supply and, and use of drugs, which is an extremely violent, organised criminality emanating from exporter places like London, but seen all over Cambridge and Peterborough. So I mentioned it about the serious violence strategy. That's a public health approach, which Nick mentioned as well. So this is about all the agencies to come in together but I think we need to really focus on the dependency uh, while, while you know, investing in that, that, and I have, the serious organised uh, crime groups as well to go after the, 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 the top pin suppliers. But also, obviously, then we'd have the safeguarding issue as well and the vulnerabilities of some of those young people who are caught up in these county line models. So the original question, what can we do you know, locally as part of our communities? Well, this comes back to my point around, around that early intervention and prevention. Uh, we, you, you know better your communities than I. And that, that flow, two-way flow of information with your local policing teams is really important. I'll finish with this. One key policy for me is around our community safety partnerships and working with, with local authorities, you know, think communities, localities, etc. And localised problem solving groups where Councillors, parish councillors, town, city, district, county have a point of contact into that problem solving group because I've found, I've found that there is a wealth of information and intelligence amongst you good people that isn't tapped into appropriately. We need to do something around that. That's why I'm investing in the community safety partnerships and in that strengthening of local neighbourhood policing teams. Great, that's fantastic. So um, uh, more of a voice up through local problem solving groups to be able to interact with the system seems to be um, a good uh, thing that you're suggesting there. Maybe um, what an interesting dynamic to have um, uh, Dr. Nick as the um, uh, the mayor of the, the combined authority and all, in the parishes conference and the primary tier of local government. And I just I wonder, uh, the, the question that we were just thinking about was um, the role of town and parish councils and the kind of association alongside your organisation, um, uh, Dr Nick, is the, was the wider wider question. Um, uh, Daryl mentioned sort of um, drugs and organised crime, um, but in the survey, local councils said that they're less likely to be delivering services around economy and, and housing. And, and I just wondered what your thoughts are around the interplay between that, that kind of first tier and, uh, and, the, and the combined authority. You mean, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, is that we've obviously got parish and town councils making very important local decisions, but the relevance to kind of the, the local economy, so and how yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I, I suppose. I suppose the question was, and the last bit of the question, and sorry, you did come in a little bit, uh, I, yes, I was, was, was around how we root um, local policy from our organisations at, at the most local level. And I just use those two as just examples of what what parish, towns and parishes have said around um, they're less likely to get involved in or deliver services or be involved in stuff around economy and, and housing was on the 
the survey. Yeah. But just to prompt prompt your thoughts about that, really. Mm. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I, I guess what you're saying, you've got your overarching combined authority and your parish councils there, and there's a there's a few steps in the in the very important, you know, local government steps thing, and and, and sort of is is the gap too big? I, I I look, you know, maybe that's the job of the combined authority because we've been here a lot shorter time than the parish councils have, so we've got a kind of um, from a leadership point of view from the board level, we've got to try and find a way to make sure that those uh, those distances don't seem so uh, so wide, uh, the gap's not so wide. I mean, I, I mean, without making too many announcements and everything, you know, if there's a kind of sense of um, a, a overarching purpose which we can share, and, and, and for that I, I'm going to kind of focus on what I was lucky enough to have when I walked into the organisation, the Independent Climate Commission, um, which has given a whole set of objectives for the combined authority to work with constituent partners, as well as as an organisation to put front and central the challenge of climate change going forward. Now, I, I did note in some of the uh, kind of signs about that came up and I'm not saying that everybody has to uh, declare a climate crisis. We haven't done that in the combined authority. I, I realise that can almost be kind of uh, posture politics. But if we've talked about, say, the challenge of dealing with climate crisis, it's, it's actually individually what we can do in our own lives. We, we, we're making differences. But at Parish Council, they can do the same. So within the proposals going forward around funding, uh, we're looking at pots, which we would, I would really hope that Parish Councils can bid into for actions around the environment. So, you know, even if it's just a thing, well, we'd like to put some solar panels on the roof of the, the village hall, or, you know, these things that there's a, there is going to be the way if everything goes to plan, um, something where the combined authority will be looking for those little initiatives. And I say little initiatives, but they're big in terms of the context of that village. And I can give examples in South Cambridgeshire. I know Gambling Gaze made a huge, uh, you know, an eco hub. I also know in Huntingdonshire, in my own local villages, there's people who make, often it's individuals who drive it alongside the parish council. And again, this thing about the engagement, you know, the one issue thing that maybe we could all agree on, doesn't matter about party politics, and I absolutely recognise that parish councils and town councils tend to be independent of political labels. That's the one thing we could all absolutely agree on, that we maybe should be doing things about the environment. I don't think we now have the problem where people are, going into denial that we don't have to do it. So if we're all agreeing we do something, maybe that's the one thing where the combined authority with a sense of purpose around expenditure, but actually us devolving some of the decision making down and deliver deliverability to actually the parish councils. That that's so look out for that going forward. I, I make a plea to parish councils, watch what the combined authority is doing and look, say, well what could we do in putting forward ideas because we would welcome that. Brilliant. I think that's um, uh, really great to hear, really great to hear. And funding came out as an issue in our breakout groups, certainly in mine. Um, uh, and also, um, you know, that, that kind of concept of, of devolution and decentralisation and just how we make that um, a ground up thing rather than a, a top down thing, which is a is a, a challenge, I guess, to the system to be able to work out. So I just uh, wanted to uh, come to Amanda then p potentially around the county council um, and um, and see what your thoughts were, Amanda, around that interaction. And um, you maybe might you might throw it back to me. I don't know, but um, uh, just from your 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 new role, your interim role, what do you what do you uh, take from that? You're on mute, Amanda, sorry. Can, maybe the technical team can uh, help us out with uh, bringing Amanda off mute. Okay. That's a career-limiting uh, move, isn't it, to um, to mute the uh, <laughs> CEO? So um, maybe I'll just move, maybe I'll just move on. 
<laughs> my P45 will be in the in the post, but the technical team might, will, will work in the background, Amanda. Um, I'm just going to move on then to the, 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 the second question that we've got today. And um, I'm going to pose this to, to Julie as the CEO for um, for Support Cambridgeshire and Hunts Forum. Um, and it's just around, um, and then come to Penny, because it's just around um, community empowerment. And, and I know at the beginning of the pandemic, and we saw a massive rush, and Tom mentioned it at the beginning around you know, as active citizenship, mutual aid. Um, and I just, we're still in this position um, in a pandemic, you know, two years on. And, and I just wondered what your thoughts were around um, the impact that um, is being had on community empowerment, whether you see that as a good th thing or, or whether it's kind of stymied um, or halted uh, progress. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Julie, and, and where parish councils kind of like fit into the whole enablement of that, really? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's a double edged sword. I think that the, pan, the pandemic actually brought out that community spirit and actually reactivated a lot of people that perhaps hadn't volunteered before. They wanted to do stuff. They wanted to do stuff really, really locally. They saw the value of it because actually it, it was they were doing things for their local community as well as doing things broader to support our broader services. Um, so it is a bit of a dual edged sword because we did see people step <coughs> They've done an amazing um, uh, role, and a lot of them are continuing to do that. But what we have seen is, like lots of other places, uh, lots of other organisations, actually people are tired now. Uh, and a lot of it was the fact that when they were furloughed, they had time on their hands to do things, and they were more active because of that. And as people have gone back to work fully, actually those volunteering roles, a lot of the time has actually uh, dipped, and they, they might still want to do something, but they find they, they just don't have the time to do it. Um, and therefore, what we saw was the mushroom up and actually they, they actually closed back down again. So we are still in that same position in the fact that the pandemic is still having a negative impact on our communities. Um, I think that people were, you know, initially, you know, they, they had a voice and they were able to say stuff. But as people get busier and busier and tighter and tighter, actually, the, the, the passion to be able to do that, I think, has diminished. So I think that it's really difficult. I think do, do think people are tired, and I think that my hope is that actually we, we need we need to support them to actually get back into that that position that they were in previously uh, by doing quite a few things. I think that we need to support volunteers better than we have done. It's very it's, it's a very mixed picture right the way across Cambridgeshire. I think there's lots of things that we can do to empower local communities to actually think about small projects that they might want to do. How can they ask the funds to be able to do that? All those kind of things. And I think parish councils are integral to that because they are rooted in their communities and they know those, those areas and they know the individuals that are there. I do want to pick on something that actually came out as a, from the last question because it was in the chat and I was reading the chat. And I don't know who said it, but somebody said, could there be some meaningful uh, training on how to apply for grants? Yes, there can, and we can do that. It's one of the things that we, we do. So Support Cambridgeshire, Funds Forum and CCVS, um, you know, that's what we do. That's our bread and butter. Lots of parish councils are members can, and all our training is free. Um, and so, yes, it, it's there. If, if we're more than happy to do more of that if that's what you need to do. I do think there are some really key simple things that actually we can make sure that you've got access to if you're not aware of it then please you know either go to our booth I know we've got a booth here today or you know send us an email but there are some simple things like our funding portal which is free for people to use so I think that we need to put things and support local communities to be able to feel as though they've got the the um the energy to actually continue on with what they're doing and parish councils are part and parcel of that and I think that we want to work with them on that. Great, fantastic and uh, we'll come to you Penny just to, in terms of your thoughts and I know you Julie work really closely together on things like uh, the, the training as well so I, I'd have to say I um, echo everything Julie's just said yeah. and I uh, don't want to repeat everything she's said but just from our behalf 
I'd agree, you know, with the first lockdown, we all saw a tremendous local community spirit, you know, with everyone rallying together to help those who are the most vulnerable. And these local groups were not just formed by town and parish councils, but by volunteers within the community. Um, and I believe the vast majority of the community has felt empowered to help others, particularly in those early days of the pandemic in 2020. However, over the last year, I think much of the community empowerment feeling seems to have dwindled and these volunteer groups have disbanded. Um, and is this because people are feeling jaded? Has the novelty of helping others worn off? Or as you know, as Julie said, they've got less time because we haven't got so many people furloughed. Um, and I also believe a lot of people have re-evaluated their lives over the last couple of years. Um, so we now have that challenge to find a way of rejuvenating that initial feeling of empowerment and value within the community in a positive way. Uh, and it's something we should always be encouraging our communities to do with or without the pandemic. Great, thanks um, Penny. And I will come back to Amanda just because it feels like uh, what we're saying is we need to keep our you know, eye on the ball and we need to keep fuel in the system um, around this to make sure that um, we are uh, through all of the challenges of the pandemic, not um, moving away from that kind of community empowerment, local decision making um, way of thinking. So I will come to you, Amanda. I know you, we had to Hello. unmute you. Am I speaking now? <laughs> you are, yes, you are. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I was just saying what a, a rich morning it's been listening to all the different speakers and, and the feedback from the various forums. And I've, I've been scribbling as I go because there are lots of things that we could be doing better, always, uh, and, and we have been thinking long and hard in the County Council about what those things will be. Um, we've got a new administration who in their joint agreement have said we are very committed to that local decision making as close as possible to places um, and parish and town councils. I'd absolutely echo what Daryl said about they, they are the places that know their communities really well. I think coming back to, to that point about people feeling um, possibly feeling weary and possibly disengaging from this volunteering. I think we have a role to play in making it both easier and purposeful. So we've heard from a few people that, that local government layers can be quite impenetrable. We have got we have got to solve that and it's in our hands as a system. And actually we can only do that by working really closely with district councils, with Nick and the combined authority, with parish and town councils. We've got we've got to sort that. We've got a chance to do that. Um, very clearly, everybody this morning has spoken about the changes that we need to make. We all want to create those inclusive, sustainable, healthy places. And we all know that we can't do that in single organisations. So we have got to sort that out. Absolutely. Got to make it easier for people to step into that. We've got to do that with some humility and, and listening. So actually much, much deeper engagement with communities in a different way. Uh, we know that we've, we have got, I think, communities team in the council who've been going out in their fantastic engagement bus, uh, asking the questions around what do you love about your community? What do you want to get involved with? We need to keep those ears open and we need to keep listening. And then I think that that thing about being purposeful, people will only continue with volunteering if they feel it, it makes a difference, if their involvement makes a difference in their community. Uh, and, and so we're talking about what forums we can create in local places for really purposeful joint decision making. Uh, and that joint decision making has got to have teeth. So to have teeth, it's got to have funding. It's got to have responsibilities. People have got to be able to touch and feel the difference that they're making. So there's lots of work around how we share what we know about a place, how we how we bring parish and town councils into the space to say, we've, we've got a wealth of data in the county council. What does that translate to in people's hearts and minds? How does it feel in your place? Um, so there's such a lot of work going on and such a commitment from the county council to be listening, to be easier to access, and I think to be able to, to support local places to be really purposeful about the decisions that they make. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and I'm being waved at through the glass in front of me. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that um, we didn't start until a little bit later because this has felt like a very, very short period of time. Well, that, though we have heard, um, you know, Elaine's telling me to wrap up and let people go for lunch. So um, thank you for those comments, they're good closing comments. And um, 
that the, the key messages are we'll keep an eye on the ball, we'll work together to make sure that we create those forums uh, for local decision making and also um, those routes in, as uh, Daryl said, um, and also um, what uh, uh, Dr. Nick said around, um, you know, potential funding opportunities and uh, how we support people through training also to be able to access those. And so I think that's been a really great discussion. Thank you so much. Um, it, it is amazing to have such illustrious company with me um, for this conversation. I hope we can do it again um, when we do the next conference, um, because I think it's really, really worthwhile. Um, so we'll close the session there and um, uh, thank you everybody and uh, go for lunch and be back no later, Elaine tells me, than 1.45. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I need to improve with my hand signals because actually my hand signals will keep going if it's useful. Oh. But, that, <laughs> but that's fine. In the meantime, I would say to everybody, please do go to the marketplace information booths. They're really useful and I think you'll get a lot out of those. But also make work of the net, use of the networking lounge where you can chat to each other. There's some fantastic comments coming up and we will keep these comments and get back to you. In the meantime, thank you to everybody for your time um, and you you need to be if you've registered for a workshop then please join them by 145 in the meantime in the lobby you'll see a little banner going along top and we've got the link to an evaluation form there so if any of you are not able to return this afternoon please do fill that but thank you everybody for your time and we'll see you shortly thank you